Once again, thank you for choosing the course. My goal is to make the training not only informative, but to improve your skills and do it in a way that's focused and enjoyable. And of course, in the near term, the focus is to have everybody ready for the all-day session. Uh, tonight we're going to cover a concept called the critical path, and we'll also go over the outlining feature. This is our fourth webinar, and last time we covered section two, which was task linking. So, all right, so I'm going to do things a little differently tonight. I'm going to start with a quick review of the seven videos we have for this week. And then I'll do the quiz questions, but the quiz questions shouldn't take more than a couple of five to ten minutes. And then after the quiz questions, I'm going to go into the story problem I sent out to demonstrate both the critical path components and some subtleties there that aren't in the uh, videos and the outlining components. And I'm going to try to tie it all into the linking component. I'm going to drop a uh, start to finish link in there at the end to try to bring that into the mix there. And uh, that has some interesting impacts on the critical path calculation, by the way. I'm also going to throw in something with the elapsed duration. I may have to do a separate example there to show that impact, but uh, there's some quirks with elapsed duration in the critical path I'm hoping to show tonight. And then uh, at the end, I'll conclude with some preparation for next week. We'll be getting into the uh, constraints feature next week, which is a very big item. And if there's time at the end, I'll fit in some quick tips associated with uh, critical path and outlining at the end of the hour. Okay, for tonight, we have um, seven videos that were scheduled to watch. They all ran about, uh, what, four, five, six minutes. The first one was a short one, a little intro. Uh, key items there was um, understand that the critical path is, a, is core to how Microsoft Project calculates a project schedule. So this first lecture was basically just an intro to that critical path method. And uh, you can go on the internet and look on Wikipedia, but uh, the best story I've got is that Booz Allen Hamilton basically invented the critical path method as part of their work in World War II for the Manhattan Project. So that's kind of an in interesting backdrop. Critical path concept is a little subtler, yet it's complex, but it's extremely important, important to understand how the math works to uh, be able to use Microsoft Project for scheduling. So there may not been a, may not seem like there were a lot of videos for this week's webinar, but that has a lot to do with the content. It's more important you work through the critical path concept to than to watch a lot of videos. So hopefully I'm going to cement in the critical path concepts tonight, and um, as that's absolutely key to running a successful project. So the next video was how was the critical path calculated. And it just went through the math algorithm for the critical path calculation. Fortunately, Microsoft does all this for you automatically in the background, but it was important to, to make sure that everybody understood how that calculation was happening. And thus that video went through the math on that. And then after the how the critical path is calculated video was the using the critical path in scheduling. And this lecture really is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, again, to say to use that saying, and it shows you which fields to look at in your Microsoft Project schedule so that you can actually monitor the critical path and see what's driving out the finish date in your project schedule. And the fourth video was additional ways to see the critical path. It showed you how to use the formatting feature, the checkbox for critical path, the checkbox for Slack. There were some good little add-ons in there for helping you to see the critical path in a schedule. Okay, that then led to the uh, the outlining material. The fifth lecture was task outlining basics. Outlining is best seen rather than read about. It's an absolutely essential feature for breaking down a project into uh, the detail you need to create a schedule. And I'll go through some of the indenting and collapsing features uh, that were covered in uh, video six and seven. So those are the seven videos. And again, there was a story problem I sent out. Hopefully. Everyone had a chance to work on that before the coming to the webinar. And uh, with that done, I am going to run a poll. Okay, here's the question. What is the critical path in Microsoft Project, in a Microsoft Project schedule? Is it something invented by Dr. Elihu M. Goldratt? It's the sequence of tasks that determines the finish state. It's the tasks that are most important to the project sponsor. It's the task in a schedule that need to be critiqued, or is it all of the above? Okay, looks like you guys got that one. We'll stop the voting. It, of course, is 
the sequence of tasks that determines the finish state. That was an easy one. Let's try the next one here. All right. True or false, tasks that are not on the critical path have a total slack greater than zero. Okay, got all the votes in. Yep, you guys got that one right. It's, of course, from the video, that's what drives out the critical path. I'm going to show you some quirks in there tonight. When you drop in an elapsed duration, it will really change that uh, total slack field in an odd way, and also using a start-to-finish link. Um, there, are, there are a couple of quirks that are in the critical path calculation. But again, I'll get to those at the end. Oh, let's try another one here. Let's see, true or false, when a task is on the critical path, its late start and early start are equal. True or false? Okay, you guys got that one right too. Batting 100% here tonight. So there's, you know, the important thing on that quiz question is there's something called late start and late finish, and it's calculated automatically in Microsoft Project, and if you wanted to get fancy with your project schedules and you wanted another way to time box your tasks, in other words, you just wanted to run a, a sequence of tasks as late as possible, what, one of the things you could do is you could use the late start, late finish dates as the scheduled dates in your Gantt chart table. Now, if you also wanted to get fancy and make your Gantt chart bars uh, line up with the late start and late finish, uh, that's going to take some bar formatting that is a, a little bit more detailed, but uh, Conceptually, if you're just looking at late start and late finish and you just want to print out the table, that's easy to drop in, and it's always in the uh, schedule. And uh, again, when we get to the demo there, I will, I will, um, well, I'll tell you what, I think I will bring up a simple schedule right now. So let me go back to sharing my desktop, and I'm going to do a simple uh, construction uh, style example here. So dig foundation, we're going to build a garage, uh, pour concrete. All right, uh, concrete cures, and then build garage. Okay, just a couple of simple tasks, I'll link them all together. And I'm going to have it start, oh, project, project information, let me go, what? Trying to find a good date here that starts at the first of I'll go September 2nd. I ignore the fact that that would be Labor Day. And we'll say that foundation takes a day, concrete takes a day, cure takes four days, and then build a garage takes a one week. So there's our project schedule. And if you wanted to see late start and late fit, I mean, kind of a silly example here because of the there are, everything's on the critical path. If I go to the Format tab, I can turn on the critical tasks automatically. And let me drop in, um, you know, the order lumber issue and say it takes three days to order lumber. Now we know from last week's videos we could do a um, start to finish link as a way to create that linkage. And notice that that order lumber task is not on the critical path, which is interesting. So if I was to increase that a couple of days, it's still not on the critical path, although if you look at it, it quite obviously is on the critical path. It is pushing. It has no slack whatsoever. Let's expose the early start fields. I can go to the View tab and go to Tables and turn on the Schedule Tables, which is going to show me Start, Finish, Late Start, Late Finish, and if you look here, start is on 9-2, late start is the same date. Let me change the uh, date format so that you can see that more clearly. So I'll go to the backstage, go into options, and change the date format to one that will show the date and the time. That looks good. And let me widen my columns here. So there is... Uh, some interesting calculations going on here. The start date is September the 2nd, but the late start is September the 9th. Well, you know doggone well, if you were to start that order lumber on the 9th, you're going to have problems. So there's some quirks going on there with how project is calculating the critical path on a start to finish link. Another thing is if the um, 
concrete cure, let me drop in the duration column here. The concrete cure wasn't four days, but was four E days. That's also has an interesting impact. Well, first of all, it's going to tell me order lumber is going to be pushed past my start date. That's fine, project start date. But look what happened there. Isn't that interesting? The um, the concrete cures comes up with a very strange total slack. The total slack indicators now come off of zero for what was what were tasks that were on the critical path. So you gotta, I guess my point here is you gotta be careful when you use the E days and the finish to start link. It will do some odd effects on your critical path calculation. The good thing is looking at the total slack field will give you a quick look at where the E day task is at and what possibly could be impacting your schedule or your calculation of your critical path there. A uh, question comes up, are those logic errors? I, you know, I am still digging into how project is calculating, making those calculations. My guess are they're not logic errors. It's just not obvious what they're using for early start, early finish, late start, late finish. And I mean, if you look at the late start, and late finish numbers in there, they look kind of weird. And, you know, because they're going through the weekend. So it's for the early E-Day impact, it, is, uh, it has to do some sort of different type calculation because the ninth is obviously uh, on a Monday, but it's it is going through it's going through the weekend, so um, it's actually, in, I mean, if you look at it real close, it's actually finishing between Saturday and Sunday, which is probably where it's getting to 1.63 days, but it's showing the late finish as the following Monday at 8 a.m. So you, you kind of get a feel for it's using the blank space between the actual finish and the and the calendar dates to come up with the total slack number. So that's how it is kind of changing the calculation. Uh, the start to finish, I got a feeling it's because early start and early finish are flipped around because of the way the task is linked. So uh, I don't think it's a bug. I think it's just the nature of the way it has to do the calculation when you have those features built in. So just a heads up, uh, you now know how to be aware of them, but I mean it's it's not really harming your schedule. I mean, you still use uh, total slack to find what you're after. The odd one, of course, is the start to finish link. I haven't come up with a good way to deal with that one yet. It may be as simple as putting a deadline on the task to fix the uh, total slack calculation. I don't want anybody to get shaken by the critical path calculation and feel it's not accurate. It is. It's just when you throw in these curveballs with elapsed durations and start to finish links, it has to calculate it differently. But if if those things aren't there, in other words, if I use a finish to finish link, let's see how that would look. Yeah, you still you still end up with it uh, having an odd uh, or a lack of a critical path calculation on the um, just in time task. So some research to do there, but at least you're aware of it. Okay, so those were the two things I wanted to bring up. When you do use e days and um, start to finish type links, you will not get the type of thing you're looking for on your critical path, but in, ca in the case of the start to finish link, that's not necessarily a bad thing because the tasks you're looking at that are driving your finish date aren't the just-in-time tasks. That's not driving a finish date. It's hanging on to a finish date. So the the bigger problem is with the E-Day uh, thing. If you're, if you're only looking at bars that are red and you're not looking at the slack, you're going to miss something because the E-Day calculation is definitely going to take total slack off of zero and put it at something like one or two days. All right, let me switch to the story problem tonight. So it's a fairly straightforward story problem. I'm going to stop and... So the story problem is the CEO of Dressage Delights is in the middle of negotiating a contract for a manufacturing of a, 
a saddle pad that has LEDs on it, so there's probably going to be some batteries involved and the lights are going to go and circle around the saddle pad while the rider is riding. And the manufacturer says they can start production by the first Monday of next month, but the CEO has some concerns. He's, uh, so he's called you as his project manager and he wants you to figure out what the schedule could look like and uh, to help him figure out if there's any bottlenecks he needs to be aware of. Now the reason he's worried about bottlenecks is uh, he wants the manufacturer to stay on schedule. Now the manufacturer is reliable when they give a date they're dead on but he wants to make sure they don't get his work doesn't get queued over while they do somebody else's work so he wants to put in some contractual time penalties but he only wants to put them on a single component of the production so he wants to put them on what would be the critical path. So the project going to start the first Monday of next month and there's nothing going on with holidays and things like that and it's the normal eight to five work schedule that's in there just to keep the schedules straightforward and the estimates are reliable. Okay, so there's three groups of tasks. There's a manufacturing group, there's a packaging group, and then there's an instruction manual group. And then it takes three days for everything to get put together and drop shipped back to the warehouse. So I'm going to take this information now and create a Microsoft project schedule. And my first task is going to be machinery setup. Well, my first task is going to be a milestone called start. I'll put it in as a duration of zero. And I'll have machinery, or I should say set up machinery. And that was going to take two weeks. Manufacturer product, that was to take three weeks. Those two tasks are linked together, so I'll highlight them and link them. And let me zoom out my Gantt chart so I can see what's going on a little easier. And then the next thing is the package design. Design packaging, that's going to take two weeks. Produce package, and what's that? That's 12 days. And then we get into the instruction manual. Okay, requirements, manual inputs. That was going to take, let's see, three days from the engineers. And then uh, design the manual. That was going to take three weeks. And then uh, print the manuals. That takes six days. Okay, so back up in the packaging, I'll need to link those two tasks together. And then the instruction manual is pretty straightforward. Okay. Well, at this point, I want to turn on a, a few things. I'm going to split my screen, so I'm going to go to the View tab, pick Details, have the task form in the bottom. And for the Start tab, I also want to right-click on the bottom screen and change it to Predecessors and Successors. And the Start task is going to have a few successors. Set up Machinery is one of them. Design packaging is going to be another successor, and then instructional manual instruction manual inputs is the third. So those three there, and then the final task is um, what do we got? I got to put in here prep for shipping, prep and ship. They say that was going to take three days, and that has several predecessors. It has the print manuals as a predecessor. It has the product packaging as a predecessor and then manufacturer product was the other okay and then product at warehouse is a milestone and we'll just link those two tasks together okay pretty straightforward very similar to the exercises that were in the videos I think I need to set up the start date. Okay, so I'm going to go to project, project information. It's going to start the first Monday of next month, which would be for this project, August 5th. So I could fairly comfortably tell the boss I'm going to have a finish date of September 11th. Uh, hopefully that's the same finish date everybody else got. And then for the critical path, I simply go to the format tab, click critical tasks, and there you go. It's obvious here that the uh, machinery setup is probably where the boss is going to want to put on the contract clauses but to to be you know a little more certain I could also click on the, the slack and, and notice here as, as I look at the slack well that manual printing the manuals is also very tight and if I'm wondering how tight this is I might want to switch my view to the scheduling view so I go to the view tab tables schedule table and I see in here that it's, there's, you know, 
total slack is very tight on the product packaging it's only three days but it's even tighter on the string with the print manuals it's just one day so uh, I've got some news for the boss there I wouldn't worry about the packaging components but if he was going to put any penalty clauses he'd, he'd want to be looking at the machinery setup so that's the general idea with that example what, what we're looking for is to you know not only be able to calculate a finish date but be able to provide some insight that could also be helpful in decision making okay so let me widen out some of these columns here so this is a little easier to look at in fact let me go back to the original view which was under the view tab and under tables it's the entry table I could have just stuck with the entry table and added in the total slack column that might be a better way to go about go about this so instead of changing views you're you're comfortable with your entry table you're seeing your duration column you can see where the total slack is zero and you you know you can highlight the fact when you talk to the boss that uh, you know that manual printing the manuals may be a place you may want to put some thought about also so what are some of the other things you can do in this view some on the critical path stuff I hit all the obvious stuff well I guess I guess one of the important things that comes up is that most people that use Microsoft Project just assume it's only the critical path you have to watch so they come to the format tab and they click on the critical task but they're not really using they're setting themselves up a little bit and you really have to pay attention to the total slack total slack field another thing you you want to turn on of course while you're working with your project schedule would be the ins the inspector but the inspector of course is just going to give you information uh, one task at a time so for example when I click on the print manuals it isn't telling me that I'm on uh, the critical path it isn't telling me how tight the total slack is which isn't what the task inspector is for it's more there for to help you troubleshoot links so the task inspector isn't going to be a great help with uh, helping you assess the critical path in fact when you're on a task that's on the critical path the inspector doesn't even give you that information and maybe they'll add that in a future version okay so most of the important parts about the critical path are covered in the videos and in this demonstration I went through this fairly quickly hopefully you were able to do this uh, sample problem on your own and come up with the answer I got here September 11th but let me just for fun let me drop ship let me put in three E days on the prep and drop ship notice there didn't didn't impact the schedule at all we still have the right critical path and if I move it up it's still it's still not changing calculations so it's kinda of quirky how that E-Day uh, impact comes into play it may or may not impact your uh, your critical path as calculated in next week's seminars or next week's section on the constraints I'll get into the eight different constraint types and there is a special type of constraint called the deadline and an interesting thing happens with deadlines it actually impacts the critical path calculation so in next week's material not only will you get the constraints all presented and simplified to make it easier to work with constraints uh, there's some very important um, video material in there on the deadline feature which is when you select a task and go to task information or double click on the task you'll find the constraints on the advanced tab and the deadline feature it has an interesting impact on the critical path calculation I'll let you watch those that's just a heads up that that's coming so this week ties into next week with respect to how deadlines and constraints impact the critical path and now I'm going to throw in one more little curveball here and part of the question in the exercise was when will we be able to sell the product and with this prep and let me change that prep and drop ship back to three days with the dropship taking three days in other words they gotta put all the stuff in the packages and send them to us they get in our warehouse on the 11th so if you had a web team and say it takes them one week and that's a long time but one week to get an item up on your website we could also include this in the project schedule and we all know how to do that now um, to link it to the product at the warehouse I would just put in a 10 SF link and there you go interestingly enough in this calculation the SF comes up on the critical path <laughs> so I still have got lots of research to do on how e-days and 
uh, SF Link's work on the critical path. This is almost exactly opposite of the prior example I had with the concrete pouring in the building of the garage. In that example, the SF Link did not come up on the critical path, yet the E day duration did impact the critical path, where here it was just the opposite. E day did nothing, and SF came up on the critical path. Absolutely hilarious. So, one of the questions that was, is there are there logic errors in Microsoft Project? I'm still not sure. I'm not sure if it's how these tasks line up when you use the start to finish link in an E-day type duration. Um, still jury's out on my end. Usually when I go into Microsoft and check into things deeply such as this, I usually find myself coming back and finding out their math is absolutely right. They're doing it consistently. It's just usually it's not a way I would have expected it. So, you know, my class which is based on something called the five keys method is all about just getting where the rubber meets the road and for my students what I basically tell them is if you put in an e-day duration or you use a, a just-in-time type link in your task and you're using the critical path method you've got to take special care to look at those tasks to make sure you're paying attention to them correctly because project isn't going to calculate the total slack as you would expect. I'm now going to segue over to uh, the outlining feature. So I'll, I'll still use this example because it fits in well with that. So if I if this was my project schedule and I wanted to now break it apart so it's in chunks, I might hit the insert key on my keyboard and put in uh, machinery work and then select the two tasks below that and indent them over. Now, an important thing to ask here is, okay, what's going on? How come machinery work all of a sudden got a predecessor? I inserted a task, all right, and if we go back to the backstage and go into options and go into the schedule options, just like I said to do in the videos, I have the checkbox auto link inserted or move tasks clicked. So, if I'm going to be putting in summary task, I do not want auto linking to occur. Alright, so what I'm going to do is go back, hit undo, hit undo again, take that task out, totally take the row out, and do it again, only change that option. File, options, into the backstage, select the schedule tab, turn off the auto link because since I'm putting in summary tasks, I do not want summary tasks links to be popping in. So now I've got that option turned off. I'm going to hit the insert key on my keyboard, or I could have picked task insert. And put machinery work in as a task. Take the two tasks below it. Indent them. Go down two more rows. Insert another blank row. Pack packaging work. Grab those three tasks, oops, those two, indent those, ah, notice, notice what I did here, I did not bump packaging work back out, it was still, it was, when, it, when I hit insert, it, a project assumed it needed to be a subtask under manufacturing, so I needed to indent that back out before I proceeded to turn it into a summary task. So now I highlight design packaging and product packaging and indent it out and I've got the proper summary task I needed. And you'll see that happen here again as I put in uh, instruction manual work. See how it's indented it in thinking it is a subtask with packaging when in fact I want to use it as a summary task so I've got to bump it out. Highlight the task below it. Hit the indent. Notice nothing's happened to my critical path calculation. And unfortunately, machinery work is not coming up in red because it won't do critical path on the summary task. It won't show the colors. And then the last one I need to do is in shipping. Again, repeat the same process. Went through a lot of that, and you may have said, well, that was a lot of work just to add in some more rows that weren't really valuable to the schedule. Well, the reason you usually use outlining is because you're going to collapse the details. And so, for example, if I needed a management report to show to the web team 
why they needed to start on September the 5th, it would say, well, we've got the machinery work going from August 5th through this uh, September 6th, and then packaging is happening sometime in that same time frame. But the shipping isn't occurring until the 9th through the 11th, so we need you folks to get your work done by the 5th. And so they can see the overall schedule rather than all the details. That's, that's the advantage of the outlining feature. Now what I've noticed a lot, a lot of times what happens with first time users of uh, Microsoft Project is the indenting and the outdenting gets them messed up. So one of the videos went through how to insert a column called outline number. So I'm going to insert that column here. So on the format tab I'm going to pick insert column outline and there's outline level and outline number. I'm going to pick outline level and what that basically tells you is how many indents a task has. So if you get something messed up, say somehow you've made web team a sub of product at warehouse and you don't know how to bring it back, dropping in the outline level gives you a very easy way to just type in how many indents it should be and move things in and out at will. Uh, it's a lot easier than trying to use the indent and outdent button. Sometimes that just gets uh, users messed up and they have a diff difficult time getting things lined up. So a nice little trick there is to drop in the outline level. Another trick is uh, some folks like to have outline numbers with their listings. Sort of a WBS code. So that's a field called outline number that you can drop in. There's also an option for adding outline numbers to your tasks. I can't find it. Now that, that, this is actually good because I'm going to show you a trick here. I know a feature's there and I've gone through the ribbon and it, maybe it's under the formatting. It probably is sitting right there. Out There it is, outline numbers. So I can turn outline numbers on and off there. But suppose I couldn't find it. One of the things you can often do is go into what's called the quick access toolbar and pick more commands and something like outline numbering you can find manually. In other words you go to all commands and type a O for outlining and you go through the section there and you may go oh there's outline numbering and you can add it to your quick access toolbar. So turn it on and turn it off. Now, I actually have another reason for pointing that out, is there is a feature in Microsoft Project that indents all of the names automatically now as you do your outlines. Now, in some project schedules, you can have quite lengthy indentations. In other words, you can have outlines up to six or seven levels, and that becomes a bit of a problem for a printout. In earlier versions of Microsoft Project, you could shut off the indenting of the name. Now the problem with the ribbon version is you can't find that command anywhere. It's not it's not like outline numbering. It isn't here. So the indent name is actually something if you do use you have to go into the the quick access toolbar more commands pick all commands and type an O to go down to the O section and then there's an outline where is that Thing at outline indent. Uh, I think maybe in the eyes indent name. There it is. That is nowhere to be found on the ribbon. And here's what it does. If I take it off, even though I've got my outline numbering, say I'll turn on my outline numbers. It doesn't indent the name. So sometimes when you're pressed for space, it's it's useful to have that indent name option and, and again the trick here, the value add I'm giving you is you're not going to find this in the ribbons. You're going to actually have to drop it on the quick access toolbar to yourself. So we've gone through the critical path and I've gone through the key items in the outlining. Another couple of uh, items I need to go over in the outlining feature and I'm going to clean up the screen here a little bit so it's a little easier to follow me. And that has to do with, and I'm going to get rid of this outline number field. I'm going to hide that column. Problem has to do with summary tasks. 
in previous versions of Microsoft Project, a summary task was always a roll-up. In other words, machinery work was 25 days because the underlying task, set up machinery and manufacturing product, took two weeks and three weeks, which is a total of five weeks, which is, of course is 25 days. In this newer version, you can actually type in that. In other words, I could put in 30 days as a duration. Older versions, it wouldn't let you do that. With Subtle, what happens is you've actually turned your summary task into a manually scheduled task by doing that. And project doesn't give you any warning, it just does it. And the problem there is, suppose you accidentally typed in three days, and then you collapsed your schedule down, and you sent this out as a report. You might not catch the fact that you've actually turned the summary task for machinery work into a manually scheduled task. If you look at the summary task Gantt bar, it will give you a heads up in, with the manual schedule bars will, will come up and sort of indicate in the same way that Total Slack indicates there's a problem. And you'll get the red underline, underline to, to tell you that it's not in sync with the underlying task, but you have to know that that can happen. And the fix is easy. You just ch change your manual schedule task back to auto schedule task, and it goes back to representing the roll-up as it should. So you have to be real careful because that's new in 2010 and later versions, because uh, it, you didn't used to be able to, to you weren't able to change the summary task. So you've got to watch that manual scheduling bug. Uh, another thing I want to point out here is there's a uh, I don't know how many of you are PMP certified, uh, but there's a practice standard group for scheduling at PMI. And um, I need to get the link to their site. There was a couple of years ago, it was a fairly interesting discussion going on uh, with regard to work breakdown structures and outline numbers. Um, it, it's almost like a religious feud uh, on that whole topic. But uh, one of the things that did come out of the practice standard for scheduling was that you should not link summary tasks. And uh, nothing wrong with it. I often link summary tasks, but the preferred method is if you're going to link through tasks, it's always to the tasks that are underneath the summary. So you should never see links or predecessors and successors, in other words, on your summary tasks. That's according to the practice standard. And that's you know what, what we have here. None of these summary tasks have links on them. But there are situations, and again, it's for continuity of the schedule. But I could understand there would be situations where it would make sense to link a summary test, especially if you've got a lot of underlying detail you're not quite so sure about. Okay, another item I want to go through here is a real important checkbox. I call it the row zero checkbox. It's called project summary task. And it basically puts in a row zero in your project schedule. That gives you an overall start and finish date for a project. It's a great way to just have one row represent all the information on your project schedule. I know a lot of project managers like to create what is essentially a row zero. Their first row in a project schedule is actually a summary task, but uh, you don't need to do that. You can just use the project summary task checkbox on the Gantt chart tools format tab and it will turn it on or turn it off automatically. And occasionally there are times when you want to hide all the summary tasks and there you go. You can just see your individual task links and see there's another reinforcement of why you wouldn't want to link summary tasks because sometimes that becomes helpful to just see the list of tasks without the summaries getting in the way. You're seeing the bottom line work tasks. So what they did with the uh, ribbon tab in 2010 was very helpful with respect to uh, outlining and uh, especially with respect to the project summary task and showing summary tasks. Some other things that were covered in the video, again, were of course on the view tab. You can tell project which outline level you want to go to if you just want to show up to outline level one, which is the same in this case of it collapsing, or outline level two. And if you had further outline levels, you could expand and contract as far as you wanted. Probably the most important uh, command in that whole list is the show all subtask. I often add that to my quick access toolbar because I use that a lot, especially when I'm filtering tasks. An unfiltering task project has a nasty habit of not showing you everything and you forget. So I try to remember always to have the show all subtask button available so I can easily click it. 
I'm not going to get into WBS codes. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of emotion behind WBS codes about how to use them, especially in certain industries such as construction. A WBS code of 5.4.3 means something very specific in a production in a construction schedule. It may actually mean pouring concrete, whereas in IT outline codes are pretty much just outline numbers. As you move tasks around, the numbers change to reflect an outline, whereas WBS codes behave totally different. If you're going to take the 70-178 exam for to certify yourself in Microsoft Project, you're going to have to learn about WBS codes. I'm not going to cover them in this course. It's way too much detail, as is earned value analysis. It's way too much detail, but it's in that exam. What I try to do with this course is prepare you for the essentials so that when you get to that difficult stuff like earned value in WBS codes you have time to think because you shoot through the rest of it such as linking tasks, creating summaries, collapsing, creating outline numbers easily because you've learned it through the five keys method. It's ingrained and you know how to how to do the basic scheduling uh, items quick but uh, again WBS codes it's uh, there's a whole topic of information there I do not cover here. Uh, again I am just covering outlines, straight up outline. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is if you have any task that is a subtask, that is an estimated task. So if I go into manufacturing product and I change that duration estimate to an estimated one, the summary task will come up with a question mark in it. So if you're wanting to get rid of the question marks in your summary task, you just can't go in and remove it because it's going to be grayed out because it's rolled up. You've got to find the subtask that has the estimated checkbox turned on and remove it to remove that roll-up. covered most of the material I wanted to hit. I could go into a network diagramming example. I think I will. I think I'm going to risk it. Is everybody okay with that if I network diagram approach? Okay. All right, so this is the, um, and this, this network diagramming approach is not in the videos. It's only going to be in the webinar. So I'm going to switch my view. Oops, sorry. Network diagram view. I'm going to zoom out a bit here. And in many ways, it's, it's much easier to see the critical path. The inch, let me go back to the Gantt chart view. So, you know, I got to I got to go put that link back on the web team work. I'm going to do that 14fs link. And you may maybe go, well, Kevin, what happened to that web team work? How come that didn't stay on the link? Well, when I was indenting and outdenting, it dropped that predecessor uh, link when I when it became a sub of uh, product at warehouse. Okay, so I got that back in place. And looking at the Gantt chart, we all know what the critical path is. It's the machinery, and then it's the drop ship. And then it arrives at the warehouse. And uh, in this case, the web team work is also on the critical path. So let's look at the network diagram and see if we get there. And prep and drop ship has the product at the warehouse. And, and you know, the interesting thing to note is how Microsoft deals with the start to finish link. It sticks the web team work after the product has arrived. When in, and you know, doggone well. That ain't how it's going to happen in real life. That work is going to happen before, and you can even see the dates there, 9-5 to 9-11. So, again, when you use those just-in-time links, you've got to be careful at how you look at the network diagram. Well, anyways, uh, suppose we wanted to add in some early start, early finish, late start, late finish information to our example here. In other words, these these network diagram boxes. I want to get some more info in there. Well, I, I have to go to the ribbon tab, the format ribbon tab in the network diagram, and then I have to find box styles. Okay, that's uh, that's going to get us into the setup of the individual boxes. And I'm going to uh, just a, diff a, a lot of different groups of boxes we would have to uh, reformat here. So I'm going to, let's see, which one do I want to do first? Uh, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to do a little setup here before I make my changes. I'm going to more templates. I'm going to copy the template I have. And I'm going to call it or KGs. And so we've already got a um, layout for how the information can go in there. And it's close to what I want. But I want to get total slack, early start, early finish, late start in there. So I'm going to have to change the cell layout. 
Let's see, how do I want to go about this? I think I'm going to add in um, two more columns. And I want to put in what? Early start, early finish, late start, late finish. And I'm going to need to put in some labels. Show, oh, there it is, show label in sale. There we go. Okay, so you can, I'm going to click OK here. But I wanted to expose you to the fact that you can, you can actually, you can actually create your own box definitions. And there I just did it for the summary task where you can actually get information just beyond uh, the start finish. You can, and then you can see here I did it for just the summary where I've got in my early start, early finish right inside my summary task uh, post-it note. And, and the trick there is you've got to go through that entire box style and you and again since I created uh, my own template I've got to go through each individual box style, redefine it, get the rows lined up, get it the way I want and pick which you know which template I'm going to use for the different components and create them as I go. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of taste if you're into customizing the, or you want to know how you customize the network diagram, that's how you would get there. And you can you can see very easily how important getting early start, early finish, late start, late finish. And I might want to add in total slack. Let's see. I'll go back to this one. I'm going to add it in, and let me see if I can get total slack in here. Okay, and let me zoom it in so you can see what I just did. So I was tweaking how that how that item appeared, and now I can actually drop total slack also into my network diagram view. So that's a little bit of a value add there. I hope that was uh, hope that worked out to give you some food for thought if you wanted to get into using the network diagram as a way to uh, display the critical path to help with your scheduling reviews. Uh, I found that, of course, working with engineering types, as it was said in the videos, that uh, these network diagram views are excellent, and it's a great way also if you've got a team that can delve into the details when you, and if you have a large enough room to print out these, which will be very large diagrams, you can actually get it, teams into looking at the paths and helping you figure out where the bottlenecks are going to occur in a project. And when you add in early start, early finish, and the total slack values, it makes it even easier to see what's going on. Uh, I had hoped that Microsoft would have added a timeline function to the network diagram so that you could lay them out on more of a time scale. Uh, they didn't do that with this release, maybe in the future. Well, that's all I got for tonight. That's an hour. It's a lot of material to cover, and again, next week we're going to get into the constraints section. The good thing about constraints, there's a lot of detail in the constraints videos. The great thing is, is at the end of them, and it shows you a very straightforward way to use constraints that I think is very practical and it takes a lot of the confusion out of it but the good thing is is once you get through constraints you'll know more about it than most people of Microsoft Project uh, know about it. I've seen very few books that describe it very well. I've put a lot of work into trying to make those explanations as clear as I could. Again, I've been working on this for 15 years. You'd think I'd get it right by now. Anyways, I wish you all a good day and thanks again for coming into the webinar and thank you again for taking the class. Appreciate it very much.